Welcome to the Samson Strength Coach Collective. On today's episode, we have Nick LaRue, who's a minor league strength and conditioning coach. Nick and I went to school together at Temple University. Um, Nick did not mention this during the episode, but I mean, man, he blew me out of the water on every class assignment, every single thing that we did. Uh, but it's cool. And Nick and I always have a slight bond because, well, I just shouldn't say slight bond. We're friends, you know, but then also what does bond us is that out of our program, we're the only two who are active as strength and conditioning coaches within uh, the collegiate or professional field. Um, and so coaches listening to this podcast who may have gone through a similar process, you always know those people in your program who kind of, um, followed that same process not to say stuck it out because you know it's a it's a different deal for everybody everybody follows different journeys but it's always cool to know um, who of your classmates is still active within the field now he's a super high level coach um, and we get into a really deep topic today and so i do kind of want to put a little bit of a, a disclaimer for anybody who's listening that we do talk about mental health um you know and the effect it has on strength coaches so if it's something that you're not necessarily comfortable with um you know that does come up later in the episode uh but i really i applaud nick i i I think he brought up a topic that is really extremely valuable for coaches to talk about, listen to, hear about from other coaches because, man, nobody talks about it. You know, I mean, really, like, in, in even if people do, it's kind of a quick, you know, glossed over, kind of ends with a joke, you know. Um, and so I think it's really valuable that somebody like Nick is – open about it, honest about it, wanted to come on the podcast and specifically talk about it. Um, it allowed me to talk about my experience with it as well, too. Because uh, I think everybody, you know, mental health is something that affects everybody. Even if it's a high quality mental health, you still have mental health as a whole. Um, and, you know, obviously within strength coaches, there's some private conversations that are had, but almost none of them ever take place publicly. So um, I applaud Nick and, you know, I appreciate him being this open about it. And I think our listeners will as well. So thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy. What's going on, collective listeners? On today's episode, we have Nick LaRue, uh, minor league strength and conditioning coach with the Houston Astros. Uh, you know, I don't know Nick as the minor league strength coach. I know Nick as my college friend, uh, you know, the person in class who was always crushing me on the assignments and absolutely doing a fantastic job. Uh, but, you know, we've known each other for a long time. We'll get into it during the episode, but I'm pretty sure we're the only two who are active within the uh professional or collegiate field for strength and conditioning from our class. Uh, but, you know, thank you. First of all, just thank you so much for coming on. Connor, my man, really happy to be on here and excited to, excited to talk to you. Dude, I'm, I'm, I'm super hyped for this. Seriously. You know, we've known each other. It's been what probably I'm trying to think. I can't even remember. 20, 2014, 2015, probably. Yeah. Maybe this one we, we knew each other graduated. In yeah. 18, been about so yeah, like 10, nine years. Yeah. yeah. Like about 10 years yeah. now. So, yeah, that's awesome. Well, I mean, dude, I'm happy to see you crush it. I'm happy to see your success. Um, you know, and, and, and uh, I appreciate it. So, uh, why don't we kick it off? Can you just give me your background in sport, uh, strength and conditioning, and then what led you to your current position with the Astros? Yeah, man. So, um, I I grew up and I I always loved sports. Like when I was when I was a kid, you know, ever since I was like five years old, you know, I'd come home from school. I was either going to practice for a sport or like going out in my backyard and playing wiffle ball with myself or shooting hoops. And then, you know, at night, watch sports center until games come on, watch a game until my parents told me to go to bed, go to bed, wake up in the morning, turn on sports center, watch Stuart Scott, go to school and then then repeat it. So ever since I was really, really young, um, I knew I wanted to, to go into sports. It's kind of, kind of all I've known. Um, and uh, I guess my moment, every strength coach has a moment where they, they fall in love with the training. Uh, mine's a little bit different, at least from, from what I've, I've heard. When I was in uh, middle high school, I, I started taking up uh, mixed martial arts, um, specifically Muay Thai. I tried Jiu-Jitsu at first. I was terrible at it, and I was a lot better at striking. Um, and just like uh, I wasn't even – I didn't really touch a weight until I was like a senior in high school maybe. Um, but it was, it was Muay Thai and just like the, the process of training and getting better at, um, at the art of, um, that sport is what made me fall in love with training. And then, uh, looking at schools, like I, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life as, you know, a normal 17 year old doesn't. Um, so I, uh, I saw that kinesiology, um, study of human movements, a potential, uh, sorry, potent, potential, um, major you can take. And 
exercise science. And I was like, yeah, man, like I'm in, that's right up my alley. Um, so I went to Temple University, uh, graduated 2018 with my bachelor's, eventually did my master's, um, finished up in 22 there. I'll get into that. But um, yeah, Temple, um, I went in with a Kines, uh, Kines concentration of study. I had no idea what I wanted to do with it. I had no idea what you could do with it. I had no idea that a, a strength and conditioning coach was a um, career path until I was like a sophomore when the NSCA like hosted a conference at Temple. And I was like, whoa, like coaching role, like get to influence winning, get to work with athletes. Like I'm in. Um, I was very naive as to kind of the barrier of entry in our field. But um, but I was like, yeah, this is what I want to do. And then my first real experience as a strength coach, I was an intern at a Philadelphia Barbell Club uh, my summer, summer of 2017. So summer of going into senior year. And that was a really cool first experience. Um, the guy who owns that, that gym and runs everything there, Jim Rutter, he is a phenomenal coach, absolutely phenomenal coach. Um, he runs a really well-oiled machine of highly competitive weightlifters out of, out of Philly. And, um, and Jim is, Jim is somebody who I've really kind of molded my coaching style after because um, I'm sure I'll get into it later. Like I'm, I'm not extroverted at all. I'm extremely, extremely introverted. And like, especially the coaches who I've seen after I saw Jim, like seeing Jim being like, okay, I don't have to be this raw, 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 yell in your face type coach to be a really, really effective coach. So um, Jim was a really, really good first experience of a, uh, of a mentor for me. And then um, next summer, summer of 2018, I got an opportunity with our football team at Temple. Um, from June 2018 to August 2018, I was specifically a sports science intern. So I worked with our Catapult uh, sports system, um, was my first experience with um, athlete monitoring, um, workload monitoring. Um, did that for two months. And at that point, I, I was like, or before that, I was like, yeah, I think I want to be a strength coach, but like this sports science stuff see, seems really cool. Um, so I did the, the sports science internship, but then I'm seeing like this, their strength staff on the floor coach. And I'm like, this is awesome. Like, this is what I want to do. Um, and like that staff was Dave Feely was head strength coach there. Ryan Horan was the associate head. Jordan Barber was the, the third assistant. And then Kyle Sager was the, uh, the graduate assistant. All four of them are phenomenal strength coaches um and watching just watching them work was was inspiring for me and was really what drove me over to be like this is definitely what i want to do so um by the time my eight weeks uh finished up in the summer and i graduated i didn't have anything lined up so i asked uh, coach barber if i could be a strength intern and he was like yeah like let, let's set it up um so i was with i was a strength intern for our football team from August 2018 until all the way through the 2018 season, um, through the coaching change with the the new staff, and then I think uh, I think I moved on from there in June 2019. Um, but during that span, I I also got a a, a part time role with uh, a private sports performance company called Function and Strength out of Bridgeport, PA, about right outside of Norris Town, about 45 minutes an hour on the SEPTA, uh, regional rail. Um, those guys there, Jason Fe Fearheller, Ryan Eicher, and uh, Marty Tomes, awesome people and just really, really smart. And also um, had a training uh, philosophy that was a lot different than everything I'd learned before. And it was really what I needed to help kind of open this door to all these other different methods of training besides the typical you know, Olympic lift, bigger, faster, stronger type, type training. Um, uh, they're, they're terrific. So they contracted me out to a local high school just outside of Philly called Friends Central School starting in January, 2019. So 2018 football season, I was pretty much just working as an intern. Some nights I would go to a, uh, just like a, a public gym in, uh, in center city, Philly and work the front desk. And then starting in January 2019, I'd spend my mornings at Temple Football, and then I'd spend my afternoons at the high school. Um, I'd take the regional rail out there, um, right outside, right near uh, St. Joe's on West Philly. Um, and then, I believe, whenever training camp started, so like July, late July, early August 2019, I got a part-time role with the University of Delaware, where I assisted with football, and I headed up men's and women's golf and cheered. 
Um, kind of my first opportunity to take these three teams, men's women's golf and cheer and make them my own, um, play with my own programming ideas, learn, um, definitely fail a lot and learn from my mistakes as a, a young strength coach. And from, uh, was at late July, early August, 2019 until the pandemic in, uh, March, 2020, I was waking up very early, um, commuting at 4.30 in the morning. It's about 40 minute drive from 7th and Christian in South Philly to, uh, to Newark, Delaware. And then I'd, I'd hang out, I'd work there until about noon. And then I drive up to West Philly and work until sometimes five, sometimes, sometimes six, sometimes as late as 7 30 PM, um, at the high school. And then they also contracted me out to like a, a local swim club. Um, so yeah, I, I work a lot and did not make a lot of money. Um, but really a cool story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really good experience. Good experience. As far as uh, the coaching reps, um, the money stuff we can kind of get into later, but, um, yeah. And then the pandemic hit and, uh, function strength, uh, you know, small local private gym was like, we just can't afford to keep you on as part-timer all good. Like com completely understand. Um, I'm still on very good terms with those guys. Um, I will, I will prop them up every single time I get there. Terrific. And then, uh, University of Delaware, who is paying me $10 an hour for 28, 28 in quotation marks hours a week, um, was originally like, yeah, we can't keep your armor to furlough you. And then my boss had the head strength coach, Chris Stewart there stormed to the athletic department, uh, our office and was like, no, like you're, you're going to keep paying him, um, which they obliged for two months. And then at the end, at the end of May, 2020, they also furloughed me. So I was, uh, I was going off on employment for a few months until August 2020 when I accepted a graduate assistantship role with uh, back at Temple um, with Olympic Sports, where I worked in from August 2020 to February 2022, got my master's and worked with pretty much all the Olympic sports teams in some capacity. Some of, some of them I programmed for for a year. A lot of them I just hopped on the floor and coached and helped them out. And then in around the time I was hitting my, my last semester of grad school, I was frantically searching for a job. Um, and I saw this, uh, this part-time role open up with Houston Astros. We call it an apprenticeship, but it's essentially a part-time job. Um, I applied to it, uh, got an interview, did a higher view interview, which is where you just talk to the computer right in front of you. It's extremely uncomfortable. But um, apparently did pretty good to where they, they asked me to, to interview with the rest of our S&C staff. And I did that and the interview was like, it was incredible. It did not feel like a job interview. It felt like I was just, just hanging out, talking to these guys. And it was supposed to be a 45 minute interview and it went on for an hour 15. So uh, at the end, I closed my laptop and I was like, holy shit, am I about to move to Florida for a part-time job? <laughs> no, yeah, it was awesome. Um, and then uh, my, my, my then boss at the time, Nick Shedd was like, we'll give you a call in like a week and let you know. Um, so then I'll never forget, I was in, I was in one of my grad school classes, um, night class. I saw a number um, from Virginia. I knew Nick was from there. And I was like, all right, well, we're going to find out. So I just stormed out of class, answered the phone. He's like, Nick, it's Nick Shedd. Like, um, you, we loved your interview. You were super overqualified for the apprenticeship. We actually have a full-time position in West Palm Beach, Florida, um, that it's yours if you want it. And I was like, yeah. Um, Definitely. So I, that was February 7th, 2022. And by February 28th, 2022, I was down here in West Palm beach reported for camp and we're recording this on February 21st, 2024. And I'm still here. Um, I did my first two years down at the complex in the, uh, the FCL for a complex league rookie ball. And then this upcoming season, I will be in high a ball, uh, in Asheville. Um, and I am super, super excited super excited and I'm sure we'll get into it. Like I, I love my job. Um, I would not trade my, my job for the world world. I absolutely love what I do. I work with an elite strength staff. I work with a phenomenal group of players. Um, we were valued in our organization. I think we do really, really good work and what we do helps these guys develop into, into big league baseball players. Um, so yeah, I absolutely love my job. And the ring's got to help too a little bit. I'm yeah, sure. yeah. Uh, we did win a World <laughs> Series in 2022, which was uh, surreal, man. Like absolutely surreal. Like childhood dream come true in the form yeah. of a minor league strength coach. But like just being able to 
experience that and they flew us out to Houston for games one and two, brought us out on the field before game two. It, it was unbelievable. And I have a World Series ring and, and all. It's it's so cool, man. Like uh, um, I, I can't like not smile when I talk about it. I think that's the coolest part of this profession, right? Is that, you know, like you said, you were obsessed with sports when you were younger. I remember, you know, I would come home, I'd play NCAA football until, you know, it was time to go to bed. I'd wake up and then I'd catch ESPN in the morning just like you and then leave. You know, it's like all these moments, you know, or even like when you were just a kid, like and you're shooting around and you're just like, oh, 10 seconds left on the clock. He shoots it, you know, and like you miss it. He's like, oh, yeah, in five seconds. You don't even know how it happened. You know, like yeah. just messing around. Right. Like all these moments, like you kind of build these moments up in your head. And then you actually get to go out and, and live them. You know, I remember going to the Sunbelt tournament for the first time, like, wow, like this is a postseason basketball tournament. You know, like I didn't watch the Sunbelt growing up, obviously. I was a, you know, Big East, Syracuse kind of guy. Uh, but I mean, like just being in those environments and, and, and when something's on the line and being a part of the staff, and it, it's just such an awesome experience. I feel like it's just such a cool aspect of strength and conditioning as a whole. Yeah, absolutely, man. Just like you said, just being a part of the experience is, it, it's, it's what makes it's what makes our profession so so fun. It's what makes our job so cool. Absolutely, you know one one thing I do want to touch on too. Like you brought up from each position that you had uh, as you were coming up as a strength coach, different things that you took from each. And, and uh, what I love too is that each position was a different style of coaching, right? Or a different emphasis. Um, you know, do you feel like those that blend of, you know, having a coach who's a little bit more introverted and then go into more of a football role, you know, where I know, I know coach Feely, I know how he operates, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a very different from introverted and then going into more of a physio role, you know, do you feel like that really helped you find your footing within the field and then helped you kind of inspire your uh, love for the field as you were coming up? Yeah, man, for sure. Like I'm, I'm, I'm a huge stat nerd and I love uh I love the 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 thought of Bayesian updating where like insight is created from taking prior knowledge and mixing them with new observations. And you take you take your priors, you take these new observations you 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 take, and that's what leads to greater insight. And that's that's what I think I can attribute a lot of my my coaching career to. Like each each stop I made, each coach I was able to to observe and talk to and just listen to and see how they do things um it's it, it's made me a lot more confident in my coaching abilities for sure i mean absolutely and they have those different experiences in different areas it's just uh like just a couple weeks ago i interviewed um, one of the coaches out at new mexico state right and not even one of the coaches right it's eric klein the director of performance there right but he talked about having a toolbox and learning how to be uh, under you know how to have a massive toolbox but then also not over specializing in one thing right mm -hmm. you know using the, all those tools to incorporate into the coach that you want to be um and that's what really contributes to high quality coaching in my opinion for sure i agree yeah. You know, it's funny, too, is that you bring that up. You were interning with Temple football at the time I was interning with Tennessee football. Mm -hmm. And my boss was Craig Fitzgerald, who was best friends with Dave Field. Yeah. And so uh, they call each other at be, like 415 at, at like every, every morning, single yeah. every single morning. Yeah. yeah, dude. I remember he put me on FaceTime with Coach Feely. One oh, time, really? And I was like, I was like, I'm so sorry that you have to talk <laughs> to me. Like, I think I have yeah. nothing to contribute right now. And so, you know, at the same time you were interning there, you know, we were you were probably in a couple of rooms. Yeah, no, or <laughs> sometimes in the same room. Yeah. Could, yep, yeah. yeah. Coach, let, let me put it to Scott. Coach Feely is an incredible coach and he's like an also an incredible human being. Like he's he did. When I was interning there, he did some some stuff for me to to help me both in as a coach and outside in in the personal aspect that that was really stuff he didn't have to do, and he's just phenomenal at like incredible, incredible coach, incredible human being, man. Exactly the same for Fitz, and I'm sure that's why they were such good friends, yeah. right? You know, because they those type of people usually tend to uh, identify each other with. Yeah, them for field. sure. Yeah. Well, you know, obviously you have a massive passion for the field. You have a massive passion, passion for your position and where you're at with the Astros. Uh, you know, one thing that I am curious about, and I don't think it's a secret within the minor leagues and within baseball as a whole, is that there's a pretty significant language barrier yeah. with athletes. You know, uh, a lot of people don't don't end up speaking English. Um, and I think it's probably one of the most common uh, sports for that to happen. You know, how do you kind of approach your language barrier uh, with your athletes that you currently work with? Yeah, so um, just to give everyone a background. So where, where I've been in the last two years in the Florida Complex League, I 
we are pretty much strictly Latin players on our team, uh, Spanish speakers. Um, I think my first year we had maybe five Americans. And I think this past year we had zero, maybe one. Um, but like in the, in the end, dude, in the, in the grand scheme of things, like, um, you take a look at these players and who they are and what they're doing. Like, this is their careers, right? This is what they have chosen to do with their life. Um, you know, they're not going to school on the side. They're not going to work at the end of the day. Like this is their job. Right. And what they are chasing is they're chasing, obviously their, their dream to be a professional baseball player, but they're, they're also chasing, you know, there is an enormous wage gap between the minor leagues and the major leagues. They are chasing wealth for them, their families and the generations behind them. Um, and that's, that's a big deal. Like that's, that's no small thing. And especially like a lot of these guys, uh, a lot of land players don't have a formal education like at all. Um, a lot of them finish like leave school to like work for their families or to pursue baseball as young as 11 years old. Um, so with, with all that being said, um, with all, with all that being said, like it's obviously important to get these guys to believe that you have their best interests, that every decision you make and that everything that you are doing and that you are having them do within the scope of your job is in the best interest of their career. And no matter if it's American or Latin American or anywhere else, anywhere else in the world, um, they're from like that, is, that is the most important thing to get these guys to not, not just buy into, but believe because that that's what we're doing. Like, that's what we're, that's what, that's what we're here for. Like, um, we are servants to our athletes in the sense, in the sense that we are there to help them progress in their, in their careers. Like I'm not, I'm not a coach to boost my ego, to like boost myself up. I, I genuinely care about helping these guys, about doing what's in the scope of my job to help these guys advance in their careers. So with that being said, on the, on the Latin, with the Latin, group of Latin Americans, um, I came into this job, I knew zero Spanish, like maybe 25 words. Um, so like that first year was tough. Um, Again, my coaching style isn't loud, isn't raw, raw, raw. I can get through to guys non-verbally or less verbally. Um, but I, I also like, I took it upon myself to learn Spanish. Um, I submerged myself in it. I have an app on my phone, 75% of what I put on my TV, TV show or movie, like it's Spanish subtitles. I listen to Latin music. Um, if I have like a random thought in my head, I open up translator, type it in just to see how it looks. And, you know, two years later, I'm, I'm not fluent. I'm not close to fluent, um, but I'm conversational, I would say, like hesitantly say, um, definitely not, not the best among Americans either with where I work. Like my boss, Chris, his Spanish is phenomenal. Um, we, ha we have an athletic trainer here who is, she's American. She was in the DR for a year and she, I don't know what her Spanish background was before, but she's like completely fluent and it's insanely impressive. Um, so like one learning the language and getting in front of the guys and coaching in Spanish and like not being afraid to make mistakes because like in the end, like, like you, if I, if I conjugate something wrong, my grammar is wrong. I use the wrong word. Like they'll laugh, but they'll understand. And like, that's, that's kind of how we, we build trust between each other. Like, like they know that I'm being vulnerable and not speaking a language that I speak fluently, but I'm trying. And like, at least I hope that like, that gets through to them to be like, okay, like he cares. Like he want he wants to communicate in our language. So he cares. And it's the same thing with me. Like, I would say like some of my favorite moments in my job are like, we're just in the dugout during a game. I'm speed, I'm sitting next to one of my guys. And I'm especially like back in 22 when like my Spanish was woof. It was really bad. Um, and I'm just speaking broken Spanish and he's speaking broken English. And we're just like kind of play going back and forth, like figuring out what we're saying to each other and like that's that's just that's how you build bonds man like the, there's there's nothing like there's nothing like it there it, seriously um I, I love all my land players and uh, it's so cool to learn their culture and like understand where they come from and what they're playing for what they're here for because in the end like they're professional athletes but it's also hard to leave your country especially like the cubans who like i i'm not an expert on u.s and cuban diplomatic relationships but like it's 
they they go through a lot of shit to get here. I know that. Um, all these guys do. And they're in this new country. Um, a lot of them, some of them speak incredible English. Some of them speak okay English. Some of them try, but don't really speak much English. And some of them don't speak any English. And it's hard to be in a country where you don't speak your own language. It's hard to, it's hard to learn how to operate, especially when like you don't have the, the same education system that we have in America. It's, it's difficult. Um, and yeah, yeah, man, like it just, just bonding with them and being around them and showing, showing them that you care and that you want what's best for their careers and doing it, doing whatever you got to do to, to get it through to them and trying to learn the language and yeah, just, just being there for them. That's, that's, that's the name of the game. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it's exactly what you mentioned right at the beginning. And, and that's a common theme I see amongst G League, you know, minor league baseball, uh, you know, any of those leagues that are right on the cusp of that professional side. You know, you, you are you're not in a collegiate level. Uh, you're at that point where you know that any moment you could get a call that you're moving up to the next level. Yeah. Um, and like you said, it's a life changing call that you're getting. And so, you know, exactly as you said these people want to know that you have their best interests at heart. And so I think even a simple thing is just speaking broken Spanish to them, right. And, and struggling through those things, it does show them that, okay, this guy at least cares enough to try, you know, like he is going to be vulnerable. Like you said, he cares enough to uh, actually attempt to speak to me. Um, and I think that really speaks volumes to, you know, you as a coach, but then also just how important it is to try to meet people halfway. Right. And it doesn't have to be perfect. Like you said, even in the dugout, you know, you're working with an athlete and, and he's working on his English, you're working on your Spanish. And so you guys are meeting each other halfway in that moment. Uh, and I think that's just such a valuable relationship building aspect. And I think, you know, that's, what's cool about coaching is it can kind of transcend uh, those, you know, barriers that people have. Maybe it's not a language barrier, but, you know, even just through small connections, quick relationship development, you guys can really develop something special and it can lead to better results. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And again, once once they're bought in and they know that you're there for them, like they'll, they're, they're loyal, man. Like they'll, they'll, they'll there's no question, they'll, they'll do what you ask because they, they believe in it. And that's- Absolutely. Yeah. And that's all you can ask for as a coach. That's it. It's all you can ask for. One hundred percent. It's just please believe what I'm doing is trying to help yeah. you out to the best of my ability. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, there, there is a question I had, and, and you know, we obviously have known each other, and we got to talk a little bit before the show, um, and I think it's a topic that uh, we even mentioned is is, is kind of glazed over a little bit, right? Um, and, and I think it's going to be really interesting, and I want to make sure we left a lot of time on the podcast to talk about this. You know. The MLB season is is very, very long. Uh, baseball season is incredibly long. Uh, there's a lot of challenges that come with long seasons. Uh, and so, you know, what are kind of some ways that you take care of yourself during the season? Uh, how do you kind of wind down towards the end of a long season? You know, what does that look like for you? Yeah, man. So I'm going to give a, a pretty raw answer here because work is work it really is an, an outlet for me from what really causes struggle for me um so i've had anxiety ocd since i was like 11 and a little more recently now uh depression and from that depression i have like severe insomnia um luckily i have it pretty controlled now i have a nice routine take a little cocktail of stuff to help knock me out and i get i get decent sleep most nights now but if I don't take that stuff, I just will not sleep. That's just how it is. Um, again, everything but the insomnia has really been around for a while. But uh, before getting the Astros job, work was always a huge part of these issues, right? You know, you know the struggles of working way up the SNC ladder and honestly never knowing if I was ever going to get a real shot somewhere that would satisfy what I really wanted out of my career. And that, that really weighed heavily on me. Um, but then right when I got this job and moved down here, I thought I made it and all that would be in the past. And then literally immediately, I just had a really unfortunate series of events happen in my personal life that really tanked me. Um, and I was in a, a really dark place for a really long time. And really all I had was, was work. So I just leaned into it um, because I didn't really know what other out I had. Uh, now, two years later, um, I'm pretty well past that, and I don't really need 
necessarily need to lean on work as much. Um, I did have a little hiccup in the past month, right about, probably two months from the time this comes out, but otherwise have been pretty good. So when things get really bad for me and I'm like really inside my own head and I get really inside my own head, um, like it helps to say that I have an incredible job. I'm living a childhood dream. And honestly, and I can't emphasize honestly enough, I've said this already, but I would not trade my job with anyone else. I truly believe I have the coolest job on earth and just consistently reminding myself of that has always been a nice vice for me. And I really have to thank my players for that. Um, because being around them and being someone who at least tries to be a highly positive influence in their careers and also all that they got going on is really therapeutic for me. Um, them and Nick, Chris, Shay, Cesar, Matt, Sam, and Bree, all current or former Astros co co-workers of mine, if any of them so happen to listen to this, um, they really saved my life. And some knowingly and most others unknowingly helped me through really difficult stretches in my mental health. And I think it's important to put this out there because honestly, I listen to all these podcasts and hear all these coaches talk about methods and practices, which are awesome. Like, don't get me wrong. It's a huge, huge, huge continuing ed source for me. And it always has been, and it always will be. Um, you know, I hear the common S and C coach phrase, right? Like coach the human, not the athlete, which is totally correct. You have to coach the human, not coach the athlete. But but like they don't, I feel like a lot of coaches don't reciprocate that to themselves and treat themselves as a human as opposed to the coach or anything else. And what I really don't hear as much is like real mental health talk, right? Um, which is very much part of the human element of life, obviously, especially in the world of strength and conditioning coaches. And, you know, it's rightfully so that this is talked about. This is hard shit to talk about. And I'm extremely introverted. So the thought of this being out there, you know, gives me anxiety. But again, I think it's important. And also the nature of our job is that we, um, nature of our job is that we have to suppress what's going on in our real lives doing our job, right? Like we absolutely have to, um, which that for me personally has never been a challenge. Uh, but that's just because it's easy to smile and be happy for eight, 10, however many hours a day I'm at the complex and around my group of guys. But I can understand if that weighs on someone else who doesn't work with the same population or the same environment around the workplace as I'm lucky to have with my players and staff. And also going off that, we're not going to work in cubicles or only on a small team of people to do our job, right? Like right now we're in spring training and during spring training, I'm interacting with upwards of 200 people a day. And that's a lot of fucking people, right? Um, and again, like no matter where my mental is going into work, I've never really found it hard to just put it aside and do my job and do my job to the best of my abilities. But I also can see how that can weigh on someone with the hours we as coaches work and with the amount of people and just total amount of interaction we bring to every day. Like it's exhausting. Um, just interacting with people is tough as someone who is very introverted again. Um, but and again, I'm not putting this out there as some sort of therapy session or anything. Again, I, I feel like I can use this platform where I'm probably talking to mostly strength and conditioning coaches about something that isn't really talked about in our circles. Um, you know, you think of your typical strength coach and sensitivity on this topic isn't the, the first thing that necessarily comes to mind. But the number one thing I want to drive forward, and if there's there's one thing I want clear from this, is that if you're if you're struggling mentally, like no matter the reason, professional or personal or anything, like you are, you are not alone. Um, and hearing that always helps me because I've always felt so alone in my struggles internally, even though externally, I know I never am. I have an awesome support group around me, but it's, it's hard to get past into my internal mind that, um, but again, like you are not alone. And although I might not be someone who knows exactly what you are going through, um, I can understand and from afar be right there by your side going through it. And again, I, I say all this just because I, I care, man. I, I care about people. I think the most simple, but also most redeeming quality a human being could have is caring about others. Well, I mean, first of all, thank you. I mean, seriously, because we even talked about this before the episode, and you know, uh, 
uh, a, a slight sense of shame kind of came over me, right? Because I've struggled with depression um, and, you know, severe ADD. Uh, and that was that first originated within uh, my time at college. Uh, and it's something where we've talked many times about, you know, or, or, or just in, in our intro uh, and maybe this conversation I've had with myself of I've got a platform myself, right? I'm a host of a podcast. So, you know, maybe those things that we do shy away from should be talked about more. And even when you say it now, like there's coaches who I'm best friends with who have no clue what I've struggled with because I just haven't felt able to open up to them on that. Right. Or uh, I've heard some small comments that they've said about other people struggling with that. Right. And it's like or, you know, they'll talk about players like oh, this player took a mental health day. You know, like, can you believe that? You know, and it's just like. If there is a stigma within it. And then especially with what you mentioned about strength and conditioning is every day you do have to be on it, right? You're the energy guy. Uh, and even if you're not necessarily the energy guy, you are the guy who brings the good mood, right? And you're the guy who uh, has to be in a good mood because the players are coming in to do something that they probably don't love, yeah. right? They they love baseball. They love basketball. They love coming in to do that. But we're just, uh, you know, uh, means to an end for them. And so we have to be upbeat. We have to make it a good environment for them because we're also challenging them on a daily basis. And, you know, for me, my biggest struggle is exactly what you mentioned is I can come into work, I can flip it and be this amazing person. But as soon as work is done, like it floods back in. Yeah. You know, and that's and that's the moments that really were so tough for me to go across, especially in my early career when I wasn't confident in who I was as a coach. I would take one comment that came because all my happiness was surrounded by work. Right. And so I get one negative comment about something. It could be something as simple as, hey, you know, when I was an intern, uh, you know, maybe that did that area didn't look as clean, as good as it, as it could be. And I would just it would devastate me because my main happiness was coming from this position within the field, you know, and, and, and coming in and, and doing something well on a daily basis because I knew it was something I could do well. Uh, and so I think that is such a key point. And like you're saying, this isn't, uh, you know, some way for you to just dump what you're feeling. Yeah. This isn't a therapy session, but I do think it's really important on a platform, no matter how many listeners for people to understand that, you know, this is two coaches talking who are both struggling with something, you know, and have struggled with it in the past. And it's going to come up again in the future. You know, I, I mean, the, the, it's unavoidable, you know, uh, but at the same time, you know, it, it is really important to understand that you are not alone in what you're dealing with. And it doesn't, it's not just coaches, obviously it's an epidemic throughout, you know, the entire United States. But I think the toughest part about coaching is people don't talk about it because it is coaching because you are, you do have to be on and you're the strength. You're the tough guy. Yeah. You know, you're the guy who te teaches them how to be healthy and how to have great days and how to have a positive mindset. I, I do this all the time with my athletes. I always tell them, rub your hands together, say, I feel great. Today's great. Today's going to be a great day. Yeah. Right. Because how many times have I been in the car in the morning and just like, I cannot, I, I can't muster up the energy to get this done. And then I do that. I feel great. Today's going to be a great day. Trick myself. And then, you know, as soon as I leave for the day, I'm back to feeling how I was before, you know? And so I appreciate your openness. I appreciate your candidness because first of all, you open the door for me to be able to talk about it. Right. And to uh, express to those other coaches that, you know, it's two coaches now, it's not just one coach who you're hearing it from. Right. Um, but then, Two, I just, I just really appreciate it because I think that's what people need to hear. And I think it does need to be talked about more. Yeah. You know, my question for you is, is what is your advice, you know, to coaches who may be struggling with it, uh, who, you know, may not necessarily know how to communicate those or, uh, or if they feel themselves in a position that you uh, have described. Man, dude, like just, I, I'm not an expert. Um, I'm, I'm strictly talking from, from personal experience. Like I, I'm, not an, an expert to give mental health or psychological or any sort of advice in that in that regard but what's always helped me is a like just being unapologetically myself um all the time even like at work like um nick larue the coach and nick larue the nick larue the strength and conditioning coach for the in the houston astros minor league system and Nick LaRue, the guy who likes nature and animals and sports are the same person. Um, and also in outside of work, just, just find something you like, man. Like I'm in Florida. I go outside, I go walk, I put my headphones in, I pop in a podcast, you know, I'm a big, big, uh, during the baseball season, I'll watch the Astros or like now I'll, I'll be able to watch my team at night, which I'm super excited for. Um, big basketball fan, big Orlando Magic fan. Paulo Bancaro's gonna be a superstar. Uh, they're playing well. Um, 
like, I don't know, I go, I go hike. Like I'm excited to get, I'm excited to be in Asheville because on the off days, I'm telling everybody like on the off days, I'm like, we, if we have meetings, we have meetings, but like, if not, I'm, I'm into the mountains and I'm gone. Like I'm, I'm, I'm out. Um, and yeah, yeah. Just, just lean into who you are and find what you like and lean into yeah. that, you know? Uh, well, I think that's really important, you know, is because exactly like you said, like you, you identify as a coach, right? And you spend your time coaching and it's what you like doing and it's something that you can do on a daily basis. Like, you know, and that I guess that was from a personal standpoint, that, that was my biggest struggle was I, I felt the same way in my about my identity as a coach. And when something did go wrong, all of a sudden it was like my one outlet that I did have was completely – taken away yeah. you know and so now i'm frustrated with how i did in my work so then it, it, it's a struggle from that outside perspective as well you know for me i mean dude, this is i'm gonna get blasted for this i swear but it was jujitsu you know yeah. because it was a moment where i literally had to think all the time about what i was doing in an exact moment it was something that made me be present it made me th think in a, a present mind you know and, and understand because if i wasn't i was going to get choked out yeah. you know the, and then and then I'm, it's done for me right uh you know similar to muay thai for you right if you, if you if you're not thinking of that you know exact situation or that exact fight in that moment you know you could just get knocked yeah out of yeah man I was, I was just about to say for me too like when i was in high school and like my um obsessive compulsive was like really really bad and like i would like everything i had to do had to be in twos like i had to touch everything in twos like if I bumped into a wall, I had to do it again. If I like stepped on something weird, I had to step on it again. Like everything had to be in even numbers. And then I get on the mats and I start training and all that goes away. Cause all I'm thinking about is like the pad in front of me or when I'm sparring, all I'm thinking of is the person in front of me and, and just learning the art and being soaked into that, like took my attention away from, you know, how I stepped or like, or like what I touched or like any weird numbers going through my head. Like I, I didn't think about it anymore. So, um, yeah, that, that when yeah. I was a lot younger, that was, that was a huge job for me. So, I mean, those outlets are just so important, yeah. you know. Um, I think that's tough, too, because, you know, like you said, it's eight hours, 10 hours, sometimes 12. You know, we had a double header last week. I'm in 16-hour days, you know. Like, you do get so wrapped up in it. It's, it's also important not to lose who you are, like you mentioned, you're Nick LaRue. Yeah. Right? And so it's important to know that you're Nick LaRue. I'm Connor Agnew. There's there's an identity outside. Yeah, of yeah, my God. So it's funny, man. Like, um, uh, during one of the off-season camps, like, we were giving a presentation on uh, on VBT. And, like, for each, we're uh, to the guys. And, like, to each uh, to each um, zone in, in velocity-based training, we had, like, an animal. So, like, for speed, we had a cheetah for um, – you know, so on and so forth. And I think for, for speed strength, we had a bear. And like, when I flipped to that page, I just kind of zoned out. I was like, damn, what a beautiful bear. And then my, my, the entire, like my entire room of guys just laughed and I was like, oh damn, like, sorry, like, sorry yeah. back on topic. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, but like that's, but again, that's the stuff that also shows them that you're human, yeah, you know? Exactly. And I think that's so key too, is like, there, there is a pressure. It feels like you have to have a great day every day, you know, but like I've had athletes check in on me before. And those are the athletes that I build even better relationships with because I've been open with them or, you know, I've tried to be more open about it with people. I know, you know, maybe not necessarily on a more public forum like we are here, but like even with athletes, uh, you know, I, I've been open about my struggles with them. And then I've had athletes come to me and, and open up about their own struggles, right? And those important things. So I think it's, I appreciate you. And I think I'm, I'm very, um, I think it's very courageous. And I'm very happy and honored to have you on as a guest because, you know, you're the first one since I've been a host to really tackle the subject and, and be willing to be open about it because I think the conversations don't happen unless they happen. Yeah. Right? And somebody has to start them. So. Yeah, man. Again, I'm comfortable with who I am as a person and, comfortable with where i'm at in my career and i'm super happy with where i'm at in my career and you know what like if like why why not again like i I've, i think i think going on here like you can you can have a platform and you can you can i don't know if i if i touch one person and they they think about and you know they feel not alone and whatever's going on inside their own heads and this is a you know successful 45 minutes for me um it's, absolutely yeah. I mean, it makes a difference, right? Even just one person it always makes a difference. Yeah. You know, well, you're going to love Asheville. Yeah, man. I can't wait. As an animal man. lover and an outdoors yeah, lover, you're going to love can't Asheville. Wait, man, man. I, I always said, like, you take me, I just need beer, mountains, and baseball, and I'm happy. And, like, I, I, live I, check, I check one of three. I check one of three no matter where I go. And then now I, now I get the other two. So I'm 
I'm super yeah, exactly. excited to get out there. Yeah. Three out of three. Yeah. You know, my this won't be released uh before my fiance's birthday. So this is great. But I'm I'm taking her to Asheville for her birthday. That's oh, her birthday trip. And so yeah. I mean we'll I mean hopefully it'll be by the time you move up and so then we can hang yeah. out a little yeah, bit. Yeah, that'd too. be perfect, man. Yeah. Just gotta yeah. just gotta get through camp. I think we have five more weeks. <laughs> uh right now I'm on day nine of twenty in a row of going in. So uh, well, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just you know great. it's the beast. Yeah, but oh yeah. my goodness! Well, Nick, thank you, man. I really appreciate it. You know, if somebody does want to reach out to you, if somebody uh, you know resonated with anything you said during the podcast or has any questions for you, you know, what would be a good way to reach? Uh, you? Probably Instagram. I'm not super super active on social media, but Instagram is probably the best way to check. Let me uh, let me check what my uh, my username is i don't know to be honest with you <laughs> common theme amongst coaches yeah. uh okay on instagram i'm nick larue 20 n-i-c-k-l-a-r-u-e-2-0 go ahead i i follow i try to follow everyone back um yeah if you ever want to talk strength and conditioning or life sorry we didn't get it too into the the nitty gritty of processes on here but um yeah no i i love i love talking snc i love talking training um yeah hit, yeah hit me up i um, love to yeah. love to meet meet new people and learn and grow as a coach a practitioner and a person so yeah yeah hit me up I think uh, I think no apology is necessary, right? Because I think that was what always interested me about becoming the host of this podcast, and then and then what I try to take pride into is uh, you know having guests on who are willing to be open about different things and talk about things outside of just you know what our third mesocycle looks like, yeah. and you know those things uh, are not as important sometimes to me as the you know coaching the human, but being the human as well yeah, too. For sure, man. Uh, so I really appreciate it. For Nick. sure, man. Any, anytime. Thank you for having me on.